I've been workshopping this a lot with a lot of people. We're kind of kind of making this up on the fly. This isn't really a, a structured, you know, something I've been doing and putting together for seven years, know exactly what I'm doing kind of a thing. This is a, I'm doing this in my spare time because the idea interested me. Sure, why not? Kind of a thing. So, we have decided, based on some evidence, based on some feedback, based on a lot of people, uh, uh, friends, family, and of course, all of you in the comment section, as well as on Discord, have all agreed that we're going to go ahead and set the precedence of the first real dungeon and the first real boss is what actually counts. Uh, my camera is too bright. For <laughs> incredible production values, um, is what actually counts for the qualifying. Qualifying. Hang on. Well, the white balance is right. The gain is wrong. Adjust. Why is this wrong? Why is this wrong? There we go. That's the correct value. Just, I swear to God, it's just, it's, it's just issue after issue. I can't get away from it. It's okay. It's okay. I've, I've got plushies. All right. So that's how we're going to be focusing on this going forwards. So I don't want to waste too much of your time. So let's just go ahead and jump into the first real Final Fantasy game. What's funny, we just determined we're going to use the first real dungeon, the first real level. Well, first real Final Fantasy. You know what I mean by that. Most people know immediately what I mean when I say the first real such and such. Because you understand, it's debatable, of course it is, but you understand what I mean by that. Final Fantasy 1 isn't the first Final Fantasy game. Final Fantasy 4 is. That explains it right there, right? You get it instantly. Mega Man 1 isn't the first Mega Man game. Zelda 1 isn't the first Zelda game. Mario Brothers 1 isn't the first Mario Brothers game. Assassin's Creed 1 isn't the first Assassin's Creed game, right? Saints Row 1 is not the first Saints Row game. Grand Theft Auto 1 is not the first Grand Theft Auto game. You get it. So there's always that concept of the first... So there's the first game, but then there's the game that is the first in its series. Uh, the Codifier, in other words. We've talked about this a lot. FF4 is an interesting one. Let's just go ahead and start the timer. Can I just say, by the way... I've seen really good game intros over the years. I have studied game intros and game outros for a long time. This is still one of my personal favorites. It's not the highest scoring. It's not the highest rated, I think. I haven't reviewed this game yet, so I'm not sure about that. Maybe it'll score better than I think it will. But this is still one of my personal favorite intros in, in gaming. This is such a great intro. What's interesting, of course, is that it's very, very focused on the narrative axis. This is all story and storyboarding, and cutscenes, and transitions. It even has the ability, uh, for basically the first time, to show a cutscene of something that's happening where we aren't. It, it, they can move the camera, in other words. They can shift the camera to another scene. In this case, a flashback, but it still qualifies. I would also be remiss if I did not mention the music. It's actually funny. I'm in this really weird boat when it comes to both music and visuals because both are absolutely part of game design on both axes, as both story and gameplay axes. And yet, I am constantly irritated by how much overemphasis other reviewers and other people in general put on music and visuals. Sound of visuals. Because I've heard people tell me, oh, I hate this game and I hate the story and I don't like playing it, it's crap. But man, I love the soundtrack and it looks pretty and it's like, no judgment, I guess, really. It does kind of drive me bonkers when I will review a game particularly badly because it has bad story and bad gameplay, and someone will say, oh, I like the music and the visuals, and I'm like, okay. I do get it. Good music and good visuals, it's a multiplying factor, right? If you already have something good, it makes it much better. And it can make dealing with something more irritating more tolerable, so... I know that's not literally a multiplying factor, because if it was a negative, it would multiply more, but you get the idea. We still haven't had a single scrap of gameplay, by the way. This is non-stop cutscene. One of the things I do like about Final Fantasy IV in general, especially for this section we're doing right here, uh, this is functionally a town sequence. We can explore, we can get a lot of lore. A lot of background, a lot of character motivations. Final Fantasy II had a story focus, but frankly, it didn't have much story. There wasn't not a lot of meat on the bones of Final Fantasy II. By contrast, in Final Fantasy IV, 
there is quite a bit we can learn just in this initial section here of walking through Baron and subsequently the Baron town right after this. We can go to that prison cell right over there and learn more about like the, the crystals, the Basidians who survived. We can find people who are getting drunk on uh, on on ale, of course, or sorry, uh, cider, cider. Gotta be, gotta be appropriate um, because they're 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 screwed up about what they were forced to do in service of the king. Like there's there's world building, there's character building, there's setting building, there's establishment, but there's also treasure. There's a decent amount of loot you can find in this first area, and getting all of it helps you to progress, obviously. We learn about Rosa. A lot of these characters have pre-existing connections and, and uh, backstories. Like, this is one of the first times we've had a romance in one of these games where the romance started, like, years ago. These two have been together for forever. They're, they are, if not literally, practically married. That's rare. Even now, that's rare. So it's fascinating the way they approach this. Because it reminds me of what I like most about the Final Fantasy series. And I know this is going to raise some hackles, so I do apologize for this. But what I love most about the Final Fantasy series is when it remembers that it's also a game. If I can go off on a bit of a tangent here while I'm kind of mindlessly going through this entire section here. A lot of games... Uh, that we, especially that we have covered, but a lot of games in general, I've noticed, have this thing where they have a pretty solid story and their gameplay is either lacking or actively bad, right? It's just kind of crap. And so you put up with it, right? We love the story. We put up with the gameplay for the story. I'm not going to name any examples. We have recent examples. This is, a, this is a recurring trend. This is still true now. But I bet right off the top of your head, you can think of at least one game where you put up with the gameplay because you enjoy the story. Frankly, I'm playing one of those right now. FF4 on the SNES. The original SNES version, especially in the US, was not a great game. I don't think when we get there that it'll review... Because we're going to review the SNES version. Uh, I don't think it's going to review particularly well when we get there. Well, by contrast, a lot of the more modern versions have touched it up and all blah 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 blah. But that's neither here nor there. Point is... I've noticed a lot of games focus so much on the story axis to the detriment of the gameplay axis. And there's a lot of obvious reasons why, if I might be so bold. It's because making a game that is good at both is exponentially harder than making a game that's good at either. It's why so, so, so many games have good gameplay or good story, and so very, very few have both, in my opinion. Uh, if you're making a good... Um, so... How do I explain this? If you're making a really good story that's you know you can do that right writers editors like okay let, let me walk this back let me let me go through the whole chain because i got some time here i got some time to kill let me walk through the whole chain so you've heard the saying that writing's easy right and that's because it is writing is easy check this out okay so bob goes down to the grocery store gets kidnapped by aliens and goes and fights off robots saving their sector cool i've just written a story right off the top of my head it's not a good story which is the key part Writing a good story takes a substantially larger amount of effort and work. Not just creative talent, but also being willing to put the time and effort into polishing that. So, we, you know, we could spend some time on Bob before he goes out of the grocery store. Why is he the kind of person, you know, establishing him, establishing his connections to the earth, or lack of connections, why is it that he's the kind of person who is willing to accept this kind of a burden for the sake of his people? Um, why is it that he gels so immediately with fighting off the robots? Uh, why is it that he is willing to accept this insane thing so that the people who are paying attention the first time around can look at it and be like, ah, that makes sense. And the people who aren't paying super attention but are still paying some attention can say, oh, that makes sense after the fact, right? Like, you, you can lay those kind of bricks early so that people can attach them before or after. That's the kind of thing that can flesh that story out into something real, into an actual story. You could take any damn dumb premise and turn, turn a good story out of it. I should know, I have an entire lorium about that, which I call the cloud effect, uh, in which, you know, you take a dumb premise, like there's a nebula over there that's got coffee in it, not literally, and you could, yeah, hey, we're, we're gonna turn a good story out of that, because sure, why not? But there's the second layer on top of that, too, because a good story needs a good editor, too. Now, there's so many examples of this that I'm, I'm spoiled for choice. Uh, I could, of course, mention A New Hope, but... All I'm going to say is that pretty much every story needs at least one solid good editing pass. Uh, that's how things like pacing and tempo all come into the account. You, you want the story to have the right beats at the right time in the right ways. So even if you write the best story ever, 
even if you write a story that's good, it could still be bad because of how the editing works. Uh, I'll name it a gaming example recently, Tales of Arise, uh, which is oh, generally a game that I enjoy the story of and I love the characters in. It's still a game that just made me want to tear my hair off because of how much it needed that freaking editing pass and it absolutely did not have one. Okay, so now we've got good writing, okay, which takes time and effort, and we've got good editing. But we're still not there because all of that is required to make a good story, whether it's a book or a show or a movie or a theater play or whatever, or a poem. It doesn't matter. That's required for a good story. Now, how do you make a good game? Because now you've magnified your problems by an exponential amount. You have multiplied what's going on here. You now have to make a, a game, good gameplay that gels with the good story, and both have to be edited properly. You have to have good gameplay. There's a reason we have gameplay pacing as well as story pacing. There's a reason we have to have this kind of interweaving of gameplay and story. Like, for example, right now what we're doing is we are going through a dungeon in a predominantly story functional thing. We start off with a big old story chunk, then we have a town exploration thing, then another big story chunk, then a second town exploration thing. Overworld, dungeon, boss. Pretty classic format. In fact, this is... I would say the er example of how to do an RPG's structure, right? And you'll notice I haven't jotted down the first dungeon or the first boss yet, nor the end of the intro, because after all, we haven't reached any of those points yet, per our new definitions of the first reel as opposed to the first tutorial. This is all still tutorial land, for lack of a better way to put that. And yeah, I know that in some games you could argue that tutorial land lasts forever, looking at you, Nino Kuni, but the point remains. So. Having a game that has a good story and has good gameplay and the two combine, the two complement each other, that's rare. Anybody who's known me for any time knows that there's actually one specific game that taught me that that's possible, because I actually didn't think it was possible. For the longest time, I assumed that there were games that had good gameplay and snippets of story that you can interpret, like Mega Man or Mario or even the early Zeldas, and I thought they were games that had, you know, good story, but you kind of put up with the gameplay in order to enjoy that story. But it wasn't until Final Fantasy VI that I discovered that it was possible to have good story and good gameplay side by side, that that crucial mix was something that can happen. And I bring all that up because... Well, I don't actually remember why. I've lost my train of thought at this point. I've been talking for like 14 minutes. I apologize for wasting your time. But I hope you at least get the overall point that I am generally going for. I, it is rare. It is rare and it's difficult to have gameplay pacing which coincides with story pacing. And I do think this absolutely is tied into the overall point of this little mini-series. The thing that's been engaging my brain while I've been hauling heavy things in 90 degree weather with 80% humidity. Jesus God, kill me! Um, is I've been thinking about structure. How much emphasis you put on what where is interesting. Let me name an example that was actually that actually came up very very recently um, as we were talking about this because one of my viewers uh, brought this idea to my attention. Well, because because it's been bouncing on my head. Um, Dragon Age Origins and Mass Effect One both have at first glance you think they have similar structure, but actually they have fundamentally different structure. So. Mass Effect 1, right? You start off with the tutorial area, which doesn't count for anything, and then you go right into the, uh, the town section, which is the Citadel. The Citadel is absolutely your typical town section. Uh, NPCs, stories, quests, little bits of game, snippets of gameplay, but it's not a dungeon, it's not a boss encounter, it's not designed for anything like that. Looks like I get one more in. Um, ah, I was wrong. <laughs> I'm gonna pay for that. And so, okay, I'm with that. Uh, and the Citadel's awesome, obviously. But the thing that's interesting about Mass Effect is, so what's the first boss in Mass Effect? The answer is, I can't tell you. What's the first dungeon in Mass Effect? The answer is, I can't tell you. Because it's up to you. It is completely morphic based on player choice. You, once you leave the Citadel, which you can actually leave the Citadel before you even finish the Citadel, uh, have full freedom of deciding to go pretty much wherever you want to. And you could go to Neveria first, for example. You go to Ver uh, not Vermeer, um, Pharos first. Or you could go to just one of the random spots and do one of the random areas and quests kind of things and have one of those terrible ass things as your, you know, like the, you remember the one chunk of like dungeon that's like the one dungeon you see 50 times? Yeah, that you could have that be your first dungeon. 
And your first boss, even even though I, at first I thought, oh, there's only one boss that can be your first boss. I was wrong. My brother, uh, Lord, put, put it out. There's actually two potential first bosses. There's either uh, the creature on Pharos, which I can't even remember right now, which 50,000 people are going to jump into chat right now to explain, or it's Benezia. One way or another, those are the two bosses. Those are gatekeeped until because you, you can't go to Vermeer until you do at least one of them. But it's still up to you. So that's interesting structure and very fitting for the kind of game that Mass Effect is. Now you're probably thinking, oh well, yeah, that makes perfect sense. It's an open, it's an RPG where your choices matter, right? Yeah, exactly. Just like Mega Man. Think about it. Mega Man, especially from Mega Man uh, Seven and onwards, is absolutely structured like that. The idea is you go through the intro section, which is predominantly story-based. It's a bit of a tutorial, but it's predominantly story-based. And then once you're out of the intro and you've got your basic premise and your concepts, the next thing you do is you choose what your first dungeon is and what your first boss is. Now, Dragon Age Origins, I promise you this. God, I am just still talking. I apologize. Um, at some point, we'll actually get to the first dungeon, first boss of this game. And I'll shut up so we can do some jump cut. Because I know you're not here to listen to my stupid ass. But... Dragon Age Origins is interesting because, once again, it follows the same general concept, but kind of, like, mirrored. Because you start off with that total choice. What's your origin? Each of those origins is very differently structured from each other. Uh, some of them very clearly have dungeons. Some of them kind of don't. Some of them pretty definitively have bosses, and some of them kind of don't. The order in which you go through the specific origin changes a lot, depending on the origin you pick. Uh... The Alienage Elf, for example, does pretty solidly have a dungeon and a, a boss fight, but it also has a fairly strong town section before that, whereas, by contrast, the Human Noble barely has a town section, goes immediately into a micro-dungeon, and then ends without any real structural boss fight, and so forth and so on. Each of them is a little bit different. Now, the Mage is a perfect example of this. The Mage has an extended dungeon, probably the longest of all the dungeons because it takes up a huge chunk of it, then you have a micro-boss in terms of having a dialogue boss fight with the Pride Demon, quote-unquote. But then it keeps going. Then you have a town section. Then you have another dungeon, a smaller dungeon. And then it goes ahead and moves forward. So you get the idea, right? So the origins can be all kinds of things structurally. But then you're funneled. Every origin goes to Ostagar. Goes out into the wilds, meets Morrigan comes back, so you have town section and a brief overworld section, because that's what the wilds really functions at, the Kukiri wilds. I think it's Kukiri wilds. Um, I may be saying that wrong, but because that's that sounds wrong. Um, there's, the, there's, the, there's the town section, there's the overworld section, and then you have your first dungeon. Every character in Origins is always funneled to the first real dungeon, which is that damn lighthouse, and the first real boss, which is that ogre. No matter what origin you pick, that's your first boss, that's your first dungeon. You even have your first real town after that, Lothering, which teaches you about uh, party members, it teaches you about recruitment, it teaches you about side quests, and it teaches you about crafting. So, you have a tremendous amount of malleability when it comes to origins, until you have none, but then as soon as you leave Lothering, what can you do? Well you can then go do whatever you want in whatever order, with some exceptions. Because origins can go a lot of different ways depending on the order in which you do things. So you see how it's fascinating because you're, you're it's massively choiced, you know, it's very Mega Man-y, and then it's very linear, and then it's right back to being very Mega Man-y. But because of that structure, you're always going to have the same first dungeon, you're always going to have the same first boss, and your intro is always going to end at the same time too, the end of Lothering. So no matter what, despite the massive choice and malleability of Origins, you're always going to have the same outcome. It's fascinating to think about. Sorry, I, I'm gushing at this point. <sighs> um, I suppose I should talk about this game. Should I talk? Oh, sorry. FF4 is over here today. Usually, the games are like over there, so I'm used to pointing that way. I've gotten into the habit of just thinking. I do this in real life. I stream so much. I, I stream like eight to nine hours a day seven days a week so i've gotten into the habit of like when i'm talking to someone i'll be like well, what about this over here and i'll just point to my right because i'm used to the game being over there is this the first boss no i'm joking i'm joking of course this isn't the first boss just like uh titan isn't the first boss just like the mist dragon and we all know the first real boss and it's one of those interesting things because you can kind of know it when you see it but I think for some of these games, it's going to be a lot more debatable. Until we get to FF10, that's going to be insane. As always, the intro, the end of the intro is very, very, very debatable. And 
and I can hear a lot of arguments for this. My personal opinion, the intro ends right here, which is why, I turn, you know, why I'm talking about it. The moment you get rid of you, the moment you have access to, like, you know, this whole setup is, is in my opinion, when this game uh, finally reaches that crucial point. Uh, hang on, I need to do this. There we go. Because, well, I actually have a lot of reasons. And I, I can discuss the gameplay design that's going on here, because there's so much. There's so much gameplay design going on here. Did you notice that Kane and Cecil start off high enough level that they're just running over enemies? Uh, there's a term in Fire Emblem that people know better than me, which describes this exact same concept. It's the concept where you've got one character who is pretty much carrying the rest of the party, but eventually they drop off in usefulness. And that is actually Dark Knight Cecil here to a T. By the time we hit Ordeals, he is worthless. And just there is an HP sponge and a potion flinger. But, obviously... Uh, <laughs> But you get the point. It's it's fascinating to think about because now she's level one with no HP. He's level like ten, I want to say. I, I forget the exact number, but he's pl plenty high level with tons of HP, and he hits like a truck. And of course, if we're playing a real version of this game, he would actually have the darkness attack, which gives him an AOE attack. So he's got the frontline coverage. He is absolutely the tank and the DPS here, and he can help Rydia get to the point where she can actually be contributory, which is good because eventually she will be our best damage dealer. It'll take her a while to get there, but she'll get there. I didn't even mean to attack with her. I'm stupid. I don't want to get too much into the, the weeds of game design here, though, because this is mostly about the structure and, well, you know. So let's just summon Chocobo here. The greatest of all summons, Choco Bop, ladies and gentlemen. Behold its glory. It actually hits pretty hard. She also levels very quickly. Of course she does. She starts at level one. Anyways, I'm going to shut up for a minute. Okay. I lied. 2201. First dungeon. Now, what's really interesting about this dungeon is it's actually kind of two dungeons, but it's not really. It's, it is one dungeon. For, in every way that counts, this is one dungeon. Let's go ahead and cure ourselves. Live. Live, Rydia. So, we're out of the intro, but we haven't hit our first real dungeon yet. But we hit our first real dungeon immediately after leaving the intro. That makes sense. You'll also notice, uh, going back to the idea I was talking about, FF4 continues to be very focused on story, just like FF2, but also remembers that gameplay is a feature and function of it. We've had decent chunks of gameplay. We've actually gone through an entire tutorial dungeon prior to this point and have already fought a boss fight, technically two. We've had plenty of combat, and we've had decent leveling, and there's some good game design stuff going there. So again, it remembers it's a game. It's important. Uh, too, too many RPGs forget that they are also games. Oh, crap. That sucks. Um, I, uh, okay. Uh, hmm. I'll get back to you on this. Okay, that didn't take that long. We got really lucky, and he retoted Cecil. Thank God. I still don't have the ability to... Oh, actually, I think... No, that gets... That only gets sort of poison, does it? Hang on, let me just check my items here. Heals conditions. Is that going to get rid of... Hey, it does! Okay, cool. We're good, we're good, we're good, we're good. Everything's fine, everything's fine. Also, I... I can't write in this game, I swear to God. Anyways... You know, I was just thinking. This is probably why Dark Knight is a tank in Final Fantasy XIV instead of being a DPS. Even though it should be a DPS, and I stand by that firmly. Because he's here... Cecil is here to tank. Like, he can do some decent DPS, really. But, no, he's, he's here to tank. Because, well... And, well, okay, that's actually not as, as good of an example as I was hoping for. <laughs> you saw me an annihilate the entire party earlier with one shot, right? Like, that's, that's what they can do. That's what the mages can do in the back row. While Cecil is up there soaking up damage and being a giant pile of health and armor. 
he's tanking, right? I don't know. I got nothing. I should mention that for the three of you that care, that when it comes to RFF4, and the Final Fantasy IV rewrite, one of the biggest things I want to push is I want to push the idea that Cecil as a Dark Knight is absolutely a DPS. That he can do tons of damage, but it's almost entirely at the expense of himself uh, and his health pool. You know, really leaning into that drain yourself to nuke the enemy kind of a concept. Whereas when he is tanking, he'll, or sorry, I'm saying that wrong direction. When he is a paladin, he will be a turbo tank instead. Although, I don't know, what, what would you do? Like, given the choice. Just curious of any thoughts. I usually read the chat, and I always read the comments uh, for these little videos, so if you want to respond, feel free to. And if you don't, that's okay, too. Speaking of, I should mention something. I'm going to keep releasing these as... This is for the two of you who are watching at this point. I'm going to keep releasing these as premieres, even if I release them at a time where I can't be there for their live. Because YouTube has this weird thing where, among the many stupid things it does, it tends to self-promote more when you do a premiere. So, in an effort to try and make sure that people actually can tell my frickin' videos are coming out, I'm gonna probably do a little bit more of that. Not consistently. Not like the, um, uh, not like the streamination videos, which will be going live every Monday, obviously. More like just kind of its own little for-fun thing whenever they're done whenever they're ready, right? This is not a project I'm committing to full-time. This is not a project I am, after all, getting paid for. This is just something I'm doing because the thought process interested me, and I thought maybe it would interest enough of you as well. This is the kind of thing I would do if I was independently wealthy. Let's put it in that terminology. Also, can I just gush about this right here? There's plenty of times you could save before, but this is actually the first save point in the franchise. This is so cool. Also, while we're talking about this, hang on, hang on, check this out. So obviously FF4 has a strong story focus. Even doing a gameplay tutorial is a cutscene. But you know what I love about FF4, and I mean this sincerely. Sincerely? Sincerely. And with sincerity. The thing I love about FF4 is we're already done with the cutscene. You probably don't even notice because I was just mashing through it, and that's the point. You can mash through cutscenes. I've actually argued before that FF4 arguably has skippable cutscenes because of how quickly you can push through them. In fact, you can actually push through them even faster than I was just doing, uh, if you really, really know what you're doing. It's just interesting because despite the increased story focus, it doesn't really add out its runtime, right? In fact, I can think of another Final Fantasy that does this exact same thing much later, which is called Final Fantasy XII. But FF12 gets away with this for two reasons. First of all, you're having amazing pacing in its cutscenes. And second of all, every cutscene in FF12 is skippable. You know another difference between FF4 and FF1, 2, and 3? Pushing through FF1, 2, and 3 to, to the final point which we're covering for these was arduous. Difficult, frustrating, and aggravating. Usually involving barely surviving against bullcrap, all while fighting a control and interface that hated me every step of the way. But now I'm playing FF4. And for all that I mentioned earlier about how FF4 SNES is probably not going to score very well, which I stand behind, it's probably going to score better than FF1 through 3 on the NES. One thing I like is you get a almost a full suit of new gear uh, in, in this dungeon for Cecil. So you can tank it up even better than he already was. I also like how the whole dungeon is kind of vaguely water-themed, so even though you don't have scan or, you know, anything like that, you could probably guess, oh, these things are weak to lightning, which is funny because actually several things in here are weak to ice, but let's ignore that for a moment. Another nice thing, I don't feel like I'm so completely out of resources that I need to turn around and go back to town in order to, you know, be able to take care of the boss. Speaking, oh my god, come on! You know what, no, no, get him, I, get him, I. I don't need your experience, I don't need your money. Get him a face. Speaking of, three, two, one, and time. Or rather, it's about to be time. Boom. 50 minutes and 42 seconds. That did not feel that long, all honesty. So that's FF4. Oh, that's a weird one. I think the game being better is nice, but of course, not a review. Structure. 
What do we have? Big extended cutscene. Town sequence. Uh, another cutscene. Town sequence. Overworld. Tutorial dungeon. Tutorial boss. Uh, cutscene sequence. Very, very small town. And then our first dungeon. And then immediately after the first dungeon, our first boss. With some cutscenes in the middle. And that's my point. I, I don't feel like I did a good job of explaining... Thank you. Please stop killing Rydia. Of explaining exactly what FF4 was doing. Do you remember what I mentioned earlier? Good writer. Good editor. Good gameplay. Good merger of all of the above. And what we're having is like something that's weaving in and out of story into gameplay, into story into gameplay, almost seamlessly. Now, there's not a lot of gameplay and story integration going on yet. Uh, we'll get to later FFs, we'll start delving into that a lot more. But you could see how there's clearly, okay, hang on, here's a section that's pretty much just gameplay. Okay, here's a section that's pretty much just story. Okay, here's a section that's pretty much just gameplay. And there is some bleed over. Town sections, after all, are both gameplay and story. You get to talk to NPCs, get some lore, get some information, get some fun, get some humor, get some characterization. But you can also shop, you can also explore, get tre treasure, and you know, sell off your excess junk. It's part of the recoup after you've come back from, from, from the dungeon, you know, from the dungeon crawling kind of a thing, at least in the original games. So, I'm with it. It's fascinating. And I do think FF4 has a much better structure than the other ones, even though its timing doesn't look like it is at a glance. In fact, let's look at our timers here, because it looks like we do get to our first boss just barely before FF1 does. Uh, sorry, I didn't mention this. Off camera, I realized that because we have defined things now as first real boss and first real dungeon, uh, that meant FF1 had to be pushed out a little bit because the first real boss in FF1 would be the Pisco Demon at the end of the Marsh Cave. So it took 52 minutes and 4 seconds to get to that. Uh, so just, just barely longer than this. But like, for example, FF2 took forever to get to the first boss, which is a full hour in. And then FF3 took about 51 minutes to get to the end of the intro completely. We got to the first boss at the 40 minute marker and we're on the verge of death so we had to go back and grind and level and do some... Anyways, point being point being, this is fascinating to me. Because if you were paying attention just now, and I don't blame you if you weren't that means in FF1, 2, 3, and 4 all games that were designed for the NES by the way. 4 was was originally being put, produced for the NES and then they, they shifted gears a little bit. But that means the original planning and the original scenario design was being done for the NES. All four NES games have a similar overall structure to the entire intro, about one hour. Now, granted, that's using the proviso of, of blazing through things and skipping cutscenes and all that, but again, that's the metric we're using. We can't do an average playthrough because no such thing exists. All we can do is do what the developers allow us to do. And the developers allow us to get through the intro of all of these games in about an hour. And what's doubly interesting to me, almost all of these games... The final point is the first real boss, which makes sense, of course. The first real boss probably should be towards the end, after the first real dungeon. And yet the intro is different on each of them. FF1's intro is very early. FF2's intro uh, is also pretty early. FF4's intro is relatively early. It is only FF3's intro that takes well after the events that we actually showed on camera when you finally smash the airship into the into the rock and then get access to the greater world, right? So, I don't know, interesting thoughts, but... I was debating just playing the GBA version of the next game, but we're going to try to be you know, true to form, and we're just going to use the SNES version. So, uh, why don't I do some rejiggering here? Okay, so, now that we have transitioned into Final Fantasy V. This is going to be a fun one. I'm not going to I'm not going to say anything fancy here. Uh we're just going to go ahead and jump right into it because this this game uh starts with a very very long or at least it always feels extremely long uh unskippable cutscene. This this is when I was recording footage earlier, don't worry about that. So, uh without further ado, 3 2 1 go. I'll see you after a nap. This is another one of those examples I talk about. We get gameplay relatively early on. It's only five minutes in, roughly speaking. But this is not the gameplay point. In fact, well, as I just mentioned, FF1, 2, 3, and 4 all had a pretty quick gameplay point. I just said this. Repeat myself. Sorry, sorry. It's been five minutes. It's been an eternity. It's been an eternity. All I was going to say is that it's interesting we go through this massive section of cutscene, completely interactive. 
And then we have a very, very brief bit of gameplay. And then we go right back to cutscene. That's FF5 in a nutshell, by the way, uh, at least early FF5. Uh, it doesn't retain that quality throughout the whole game, obviously. In fact, the portion of... <laughs> Um, hang on, let me fix something here really quick. Hem. The portion of the game that's devoted to gameplay slowly rises as the game goes on. But. No, 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 but. Not buts. But, early on, there's a really big back and forth thing, and I feel like that's at least partially inspired by what was going on with FF4. But what's interesting to me, and we'll see how much this lines up when we actually do the review is this feels more like FF2 than FF4. FF4 had a lot of meat on its bones when it came to its narrative axis. I don't recall FF5 having a lot of meat on its bones. There's not a lot of characterization, world building, setting, plot, you know, all, all the things that make this up. By the way, real quick, real quick, real quick. How many of you... Oh, where is it? There it is. How many of you knew this was here? Raise your hands. You know, I've done uh, quite a few runs of FF5, and I used to do four job fiestas regularly, and I didn't know that was there until my niece was playing the Pixel Remaster version of this game. And if you remember, the Pixel Remaster has a map, which very clearly indicates there's a thing down there. And she was like, she immediately beelined for it, and I'm just staring at the screen like, how did I never see that before? <laughs> Anyways. If I may, this is a perfect example of what I was talking about. So we had a cutscene, then we walked. Get here. Yeah, so there's, there was there was control. I don't know if I call that gameplay. Now we're in control again. We're gonna have two combats or three. Oh god, I can't remember now. It's two or three. Very quick things. These are designed to die in one hit, which makes sense. We we have typical fighter setup equipment. And these are typical level 1 goblets, so yeah, that is a recipe for one shot, one kill. There's the second one. I'm sorry that I'm keeping you watching this really boring stuff. You know one of the biggest things I have problems with while streaming? I'm always afraid of being boring. I don't know if anybody else has that issue. Because I know some streamers go way overboard with being like, and just, just completely overact like crazy, but you know, I, I do have that fear pretty constantly. Anyway, so that was a brief gameplay section, and immediately transitions directly, I might add, into a cutscene. Now, what's also interesting is cutscenes take a little bit longer in 5 than 4, not by much. There's just more animations, more storyboarding, more usage of the, the frames of animation in order to try and actually tell more of a story. We've got like an injured stat, which can also is also used as like a headbutt stat. They get really creative with it. I love the animation in this game. It will definitely four, five, and six, and actually seven, believe it or not, and nine will probably be the ones that score the best when it comes to animation in the Final Fantasy series. There might be some of the more recent ones that manage that, but these are the big ones. These are the ones that really use just a few frames of sprites and a few things very, very creatively and very invocatively in a way that people pretty much look at and automatically just, oh, yeah, that's what's happening. Your brain fills in the gaps so seamlessly that I know several people who didn't even realize that these weren't intended to be in this manner to begin with. Continuing the trend, it's been about 11 minutes since we started, and it's dominantly story so far, with a few little tidbits of gameplay eking into it. This could be argued to be our first dungeon, and if you argued that, you would be wrong, of course. I'm sorry. I'm joking, I'm joking. I know several people... Uh, made exactly that argument, that the first dungeon is the first dungeon, and the first boss is the first boss. In which case, this would be the first dungeon. Very, very early. You'll notice it's 11 minutes till we get here, though. This is quite a chunk of time. But what's doubly funny is I'm almost positive that's going to be the same thing we see in FF6. Because the first dungeon demonstrable in FF6 is not when you're running around with a magic armor, it's when you're having Terra by herself going through the Narsh Caves. Which I have a feeling is going to be about 11 minutes after, uh, you know, the, the game starts, after we get into it. We still haven't hit the gameplay point yet, though. We're already past, uh, I think it was FF4, had the longest gameplay point to date. Real quick, creative use of, of animations right here, check it out. They're doing the arms raised thing, but they kind of snuck up on the, the ledge so it looks like they're hiding behind the ledge. Look at that. 
Look at that. God, that's brilliant. Sorry, I love this game. Sorry. I apologize for being positive. Actually, while I'm commenting, it is interesting that even this dungeon, tutorial dungeon, which, you know, has gameplay and encounters and levels and all kinds of stuff, uh, and is primarily a gameplay focused thing, still has three separate cutscenes throughout it before we get into the cutscene heavy sequence here, which follows through on the dungeon and will lead immediately into our next dungeon. Still not the first dungeon, by the way. Yes, that's right. The first dungeon of this game is actually the third one. You know what the weirdest thing about FF5 is? The weirdest thing to me about FF5 is random encounters! The weirdest thing to me about Final Fantasy V in terms of its structure is that it has two tutorial dungeons. Why does it have two tutorial dungeons? I suppose you could argue there's plenty of first dungeons in these games. After all, and I hate to keep prefacing this, when we get to Final Fantasy X we're gonna have, what is it, like ten first bosses? Depending on how you count it. So, like, you've got your tutorial dungeon, which is the dungeon in which you figure out how the game works, and then you've got the second tutorial dungeon in which you figure out how the game works. Like, this this is so strange that we get this second dungeon here. It's about the same length, too, and both of them share uh, most of the same gameplay features. The biggest difference is this one has a little bit more loot in it and a few more optional bents, whereas the other one was purely linear. But both of them also start off with a recovery spot right down there below. If you'd let me go and talk to it instead of telling me that, you know, I need to... Yes, I understand that I need to do the dungeon. Can I go, please? God, what's this story? Get this story out of my game. Get her, get her. Get her. There we go. Okay, so, so I was trying to say. There's the recovery spot. And the enemies are, like, barely stronger? And I do mean barely. Functionally, it's the same general quality of enemies we've been facing the entire time. So why the second dungeon? Anyone have any thoughts on this one? Like, it's not a bad thing. It's just, again, this whole discussion, this whole series is all about structure. And so, here we have just... Dungeon Point Five. Can I just say that it's bonkers to me that we're 20 minutes in and we haven't hit the gameplay point yet? Like, I, I guess that's, that's exactly what I knew was going to happen walking into this, but it's just wild that we're not there yet. I was actually thinking about this. It could be argued, because we're kind of using a lot of optional mechanics, or optional is the wrong word, alternate leveling mechanics as a way to kind of gauge when we get to the gameplay point, right? Uh, in FF7, we're going to call it when we get materia. In FF5, we're going to call it when we get access to the job system. In FF3, we already called it when we get access to the job system. Um, in FF1 and 2, it was mostly when you had access to actually running around and interacting with the world since there was no alternate level to speak of. You don't get Magicite in FF6 until Zozo. Now, that's a brave and unique choice to FF6. And for reasons I'll discuss much more in depth when we actually review FF6. But do you think that means that FF6 gameplay point isn't until Zozo? Because that is certainly a debate that can be made. So normally you'd be like, aha, first boss, right? I mean, this is the first boss, but just like uh, the Mist Dragon FF4 and Welkin FF7, or excuse me, FF6, and the Scorpion, uh, oh my god, first action, really? And just like the Scorpion armor in FF7, this is your tutorial boss. It actually has the exact same mechanic that all four bosses do. I don't mind that, really, but it's not what I would call a good mechanic for a boss design perspective. All it's there for is to get the player into the mindset of understanding what an ATB bar is, and being able to have something approximating real time. It's no wonder they kind of dumped that when it came to FF8, because by the time FF8 came out, which was late 90s at that point, mid-90s, 90s what did FF8 come out? Anyways, um, by the time FF8 came out, most people knew what real-time combat was, so there's not really the need to tutorialize the concept like they're doing right here. The idea of waiting to attack the opponent doesn't exist, after all, in a turn-based environment. If you're ever wondering why that mechanic exists, by the way. Here's the bad part. A lot of uh, games that have more questionable design have continued forward with that idea of being like, oh, well, we have to keep doing that. You know, we have to keep having the wait to attack the boss thing. 
because back in the day it was a form of tutorialization, but now it doesn't, I guess it doesn't really apply to uh, I should probably heal, that hurt. I do love how smart and quick the menuing is, although it won't truly be smart and quick until we get to six, but, you know. Six nails too many things, what do you want from me? You ever wonder why FF6 is my favorite game? It's because it's a good game. Anyways. Cutscene, of course. So let's again look at this structurally, because we're about to reach the gameplay point, finally. Uh, looks like almost half an hour in. Wow. That's almost the point of the first dungeon over in FF1. So, <clears throat> big cutscene. Micro gameplay, cutscene. Cutscene. Very brief tutorial dungeon. Cutscene, cutscene. Quick bit of explorative thing. We don't really have much we can do during the explorative sequence. There's only one town and one location we can go to, which is the next tutorial dungeon. Next tutorial dungeon, tutorial boss, gameplay point. And you can feel that chunk, 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 chunk thing it's doing as it bounces back and forth uh, between different aspects of gameplay and story. Hell, we're even in, right now, we just finished two major aspects of gameplay, which was dungeon and boss. And now we are going through an aspect of story. Cutscene. Spirit of Wind Quest? Who translated this? Oh, right. It could be worse. It could be the PS1 version. You know, one thing FF5 is really starting to get right, though? 4 started this, to be clear. But 5 is starting to really develop the idea that a cutscene informs gameplay and a gameplay decides cutscene. So after doing that cutscene, which explains the elements and the crystals and how we have to protect them, the crystals then imbue us, and now we have access to an entire new gameplay feature, the job system. This is the kind of thing that, this is when FF5, FF5, when the Final Fantasy series nails it, when it is a game. A game, by definition, has both story and gameplay, at least, it, I, I guess that's actually wrong, I'm going to disagree with myself. <laughs> it should have both story and gameplay. But doesn't I I know I'm gonna disagree with that too. Damn. Um When it remembers it's a game that has both gameplay and story. There, I'm just gonna say it that way. I just I give up. I give up. I'm worthless. I'm terrible. We're just, we're just gonna go with that. I you are probably thinking, how why haven't you cut off the thing yet? Well, because we're not quite at the gameplay point yet. We have access to the menus, but we uh I think it's that one. <laughs> Japanese, am I right? Uh, but we do not have access to gameplay, because we're not quite there yet, but we will be... There you go, 3026. We can now do the job system. Woo! We're going to do old standby. I actually know several people. Um, we're approaching this like FF1 and FF3, and we're like, oh, okay, well, we'll go ahead and do the old standby. And so they do what I'm doing right now. Which looks a little bit like this. Ta -da. There's actually the thing I love about this game, and I don't want to get too much into actual gameplay reviewing here, is that there's not really a bad combination possible there for the initial jobs. You really have to work at it to come up with a bad combination, because they do exist. And for certain specific dungeons or bosses or sections of the game, certain combinations are going to do better than others. But for the game as a whole, there's no bad jobs here. So, having gained access to the gameplay point, we now have our first real town, our first town at all, actually. And we can buy a bunch of stuff here, which we are going to do. We absolutely want to go over here. Because the next two bosses, well, we're not going to buy both, but we absolutely want fire and we want bolt. And we probably want Cure, actually, and we probably want Ice, and Cure, and Libra, and... And look, it doesn't let you buy if you already have it. Isn't that a nice convenience feature? Isn't that a great quality of life feature? I love quality of life features so much. I really do. Like, I, I this, start, this started as a bit. I was gonna, be like, make a joke about it, but honestly... I, I, I'm 42, you know? I like quality of life features. What do you want from me? Look, it even shows, like, okay, they can equip this, they can equip this, they can equip this. Isn't, isn't that cool? And it'll even show right there, hey, you've already got this equipped, so you don't actually need this, so we're just going to skip that. Thanks, Ferris. Bye. And these just get better in some of the upcoming games. And then they get worse? Like, they forgot what quality of life features were? 
It's the weirdest thing. And you probably think, when did they peak? Six. Although seven has a lot of the same quality of life features that six does. Go figure. You know, nothing I could do someday? I'm not doing this. I don't have time. But you know, nothing that would be interesting to look at? Figure out some kind of metric for measuring dialogue in an RPG. And then figure out what percentage of that dialogue falls into what category. I'd probably go with something like line-based. So, hey, there's a dude over here. They do this other thing like this. So that's two lines, right? Um, and just kind of track that. Not No, not for the cutscenes. For the NPCs. Because I've said several times that FF6 has the best NPC design in the business. And I stand by that to this very day. Because an enormous amount of what the NPCs tell you is actually... Uh, gameplay, not narrative. But like, for example, just out of random curiosity, I was roaming through town and I noticed one person said, the wind's getting weaker, so that's plot-based. Okay, so there's a plot one. Another person said, there's this castle to the east. It's got the water the water flowing through it thanks to the water crystal. So that's setting building. and Stuff like that, right? It would be interesting to see how it lines up, because you know me, I love this kind of... I, I love being able to dissect how and why a thing works. Rather than just saying, man, FF5 is a great game. I love digging into it. You know what I mean? And if you don't like that, I understand completely. But if, 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 why are you watching me if you don't like that kind of thing? That's kind of my shtick. That is my primary job that, that I, I pay the bills with, is, is dissecting this kind of crap. Not that I'm getting paid for this, obviously. This is, this is just a for fun thing I'm doing in my downtime. To, to try and re-engage my brain a little bit. You can probably tell I'm just, I'm just, I'm wiped. I'm exhausted. After FF5, I'm, I'm going to lay down again before we hit 6. Notice how the town section we just did was riddled with, with story throughout it. Gameplay, obviously, you know, like most typical town sections are, which are kind of dominantly gameplay. But it's also a vehicle to get across story. We had a major cutscene talking about Lena and his father, blah, blah, blah. Um, we also now get another cutscene. We immediately leave. In another cutscene. Don't worry, there's gonna be another cutscene after this, and then another one. And then, like, one more, I think, after that. Something like that. Told you, there's another cutscene. Told you, another cutscene. You didn't believe me. Nobody ever listens to me. And at 4113, our first real boss. Oh, you son of a... Okay, that... Mm, that actually kind of sucks. So he, he, he just took out my main DPS or there, so that... That's not great. Uh, <laughs> okay. Anyways. Definitely the first major boss here. Uh, what's funny is it's only the second boss, which will be true in a couple of these games. In some cases, it'll be a lot more than two. Um... I don't have much to say about that. It is interesting to me that you get the gameplay point and then the boss before the first real dungeon. That's fascinating to me, that they structured it that way. Could have done this any way they wanted to. They could have uh, laid this out however they wanted to. Maybe it's because they already had the two tutorial dungeons, and they were kind of dungeon-heavy in the intro, and so they kind of wanted to pull back a little bit on how dungeon-heavy the game is. Oh, speaking of which, interesting little tidbit. I would also argue, uh, pretty strongly, in fact, that the intro ends exactly at the same time as the gameplay point, that that is, in fact, the end of the intro in this particular game. Okay, I'm so glad the Paralyzed doesn't last very long in this boss fight. I've actually always loved the idea of this section. They're stranded on a ship in the middle of a canal, which leads out into a fairly large ocean. And, uh, well, sea. Leads onto a sea. The wind is dying down, and they don't have anyone to drag the ship. So it just drifts. And thanks to currents, it drifts into the same spot where all the other ships have been drifting lately. Which, of course, leads us rather smoothly into a cutscene. Of course it's a cutscene. <laughs> leads us into trying to interrupt Lore's timing. Into our first dungeon. 44 minutes and 44 to 42 seconds in. Not quite an hour. Once again, this is all fasting. I've already talked about most of the stuff that's here. 
tier two Terrell Dungeons. But also, gameplay point, relatively quick on, but still much later than the NES Final Fantasies and, of course, Final Fantasy IV. You get your first final boss, your first final boss, Jesus Christ, you get your first boss before the dun dun dungeon, and then you get the first real dungeon pretty much immediately after it. Like, it's it's Carlobos, and then a couple of cutscenes, and then we're here. Bam. Also, fun fact, this dungeon ends in another boss fight. Arguably a better boss fight than this one. This game has tons of bosses. Oh my god, FF5 is littered with bosses. But it's fascinating because, again, gameplay story, gameplay story, gameplay story. And it just bounces back and forth between these, which makes sense. Again, given what they were going for, they were trying really hard to emphasize both axes, something that would drift in importance in both directions over the years, I think. Now, I'm going to go ahead and pause here, because that took a lot out of me, and I actually need to go lay down. So I don't think I'll do six in this video. I was, I was planning to do six in this video. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'll throw it into this video. I don't know. I don't know. But I'm not doing six now. I'll do six later. I need to come up with some kind of transition that I'll remember tomorrow. Sugar Magoo! Okay. <clears throat> Glad that's easy to remember, because it's actually been several days now. My god. But I really wanted to at least get one more in this particular series. I know, I know, I know. Oh no, you have to play FF6 again. Uh, apparently it's muted? Oh, right. Sorry. <laughs> well, of course it isn't. So when is the gameplay point of FF6? Well, if we're using the same standards that we've been using for all the other games, there's only one answer to that. Gonna try very hard not to pay too much attention to this. Don't want to review FF6. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. I mean, nobody actually likes FF6, right? I actually saw it. This is not a joke. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I saw a post saying that anybody who thinks FF6 is good is kidding themselves. That it's like 90... Per I believe the exact quote was that it's 90% nostalgia and only 10% actually a good game. Now, I find this funny because, uh, obviously, I disagree, but the specifics and how I disagree has always amused me because, as I've said many, many times, this is the first game I... Or sorry, this... Let's keep doing that. This is the first game I thought I've played that I felt actually had good gameplay in addition to good story and you know, so good on both axes. But it's also a game that I feel very much has aged pretty well that is still fun to play today. Now, obviously, opinions are opinions, but it's always amusing to me to see that kind of absolutely dismissive thing. It'd be like me saying, oh, the only reason people like Halo is because they played it when they were children. Obviously, there's nothing good about Halo or whatever other game you want to use here. It's up to you. So, structure. Let's talk about structure real quick here. The game starts off, obviously, cutscene, very FF, but a very brief cutscene, actually. Really brief. Especially compared to FF4s, which is much more elongated, and FF5s, which was completely non-interactive. This one I'm actually mashing through the dialogue, so it's semi-interactive. Closer to, like, what FF4 did. Also... For the first time in the Final Fantasy series, we have a skippable cutscene. It's the one that's about to happen here, which I am going to skip. That's the rules we've set forth. We are, of course, doing what's allowed, and I happen to know this game pretty well. So we are going to be skipping some of these initial fights, because, believe it or not, uh, several of these opening fights in Narsh are actually optional. Which I wouldn't know, except for the fact that you're know, better in this game. We are going to also set this up a little bit here real quick. So, I want this, this, this. This and you back there. Yeah, we're good. Can't skip this fight. So technically, you could say, "Aha! Time to gameplay." Seconds, you know, two minutes and two. No, 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 no. Even if I was to count that, this doesn't count at all because this is just a taste of power. Although this is the first Final Fantasy kind of to have a taste of power as a concept. I say kind of. Because FF4 dipped into this as well in a different way. I never really realized that uh, until I was doing this exact series, actually. Because in FF4, you start off with Cecil, right? Who is a chonker. And Kane, of course, who is also a chonker. And the two of them kind of shrek everything in their path. Because they're, they start off at level 10. And they're just that much stronger. 
So all that makes sense. By the way, yeah, I just skipped two fights there if you're paying attention. Anyways, so uh, FF4 kind of has a taste of power. Not to the same extent. It, it's, 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 it, it's so debatable that you could argue I'm pulling it technically, and I, I wouldn't even argue back against you. But it does still have something. This is much more definedly, okay, yes, we want you to be super strong. Because remember, the way that they did it in FF4 was Cecil just slowly became irrelevant all the way up to Mount Ordeals, at which point he became relevant again. Whereas here, you start off with a taste of power, and then you reset back to level 1. You also do clearly start at level 1 here. As opposed to, you know, whatever else. In case you're wondering what a pay taste of power is, consequently... That's a taste of power. It's actually a relatively rare uh, thing when it comes to game design. I'm not 100% sure why. So we have the scripted battles. Then we actually enter... This is so structured. We start off with scripted battles, super powerful. Some of which are skippable, some of which are optional. Um, then we go to random battles. And this is... <laughs> some people misunderstood me. I was talking about the first dungeon... Uh, in, in the first dungeon in FF6. And this is actually not what I was referencing. I, I said the Narsh Caves. But this isn't the Narsh Caves. This is the Narsh Antechamber. Right? Like, we're not actually at that point yet. Real quick aside, by the way, there's so many things, this is so stupid, I'll talk about this when we review the Pixel Remaster, there's so many micro changes in the Pixel Remaster, it's kind of strange to think about. I'll actually name one of them in just a second here. But there are several, uh, just, just the nature of how the engine handles certain specific things differently. And you probably would never even notice unless you knew the game very, very well. For example, right now I'm just going to hold down the A button, nothing else, no button presses, I'm just holding it down and it will perfectly frame advance every single time dialogue shows up like it's doing right now. The Pixel Remaster doesn't allow that. You, have to have, you actually have to hit the button every time. Little things like that. It's just interesting. Anyways, so, first boss totally counts, right? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Up to you. This is, what, five minutes? Something? I wasn't even looking because I we're, we aren't counting this. But if you count this, here we are at the first boss. And, as is the series norm, <laughs> uh, that was funny, as is the series norm, the first boss, like I said, from 4 to 7, is don't attack at the right time. It made sense in 4, it was a tutorial for what an ATB is. I sometimes wonder why they kept doing that approach for uh, 4, 5, 6, and 7. I suppose you can make an argument for it in 7, since 7 was so new to so many people, but I'm not sure they actually realized that 7 was going to hit the audience that it did. Like, one of those things I've talked about before is, you know, all, all you have to do in order to be such and such is just predict when the super successful games are, or the super successful movies, or the super successful shows, or books, or music, or whatever. And nobody can predict that. Nobody knew FF7 was going to be this, this smash popular success that it was going to be, right? Now, we're going to be in cutscene land for a bit, so I'll catch up to you in a minute here. So, this is one of the biggest changes I always make in this game. Every single time, I have to make sure that it's lower, because I hate the all caps. I hate the all caps thing. It's so terrible. Why is that the default? Is this a Japanese thing? I don't know. I don't know. So, um, the thing I wanted to talk about, this is something Savakam brought up, is she was saying that the, the idea of the first Narsh Cave is actually right here. We're actually going to run from these battles. These are worthwhile doing. Um, because this is arguably the first time we have access to what we would call the core gameplay loop. We have a party member, we have actual random encounters, we don't have the magic armor carrying us. So it's it's a pretty good indicative of that. And we do have a very brief dungeon, literally one cell, with a couple of chests and a couple of little side turns. So it's the most basic thing that could be possibly considered the first dungeon. I disagree completely, of course. This is not the first dungeon. I, I should say, I shouldn't throw Sava come out of the bus. She obviously didn't think this is the first dungeon. That was actually the argument she was making, is that this isn't the first dungeon. It's too tutorially. It's still functionally part of a cutscene. It's a playable cutscene, but it's still part of the cutscene. This is the same thing we'll see in FF7 when it comes to the first reactor. It's functionally a cutscene. You're not really, you know, like, like the, 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 the chains haven't been loosed yet, right? You're not off the leash yet. Hell, we've just entered a non-interactive cutscene to further make this point. So, uh, then we gotta go through section. I'll show you something else in a minute here. Give me a sec. 
So this is one of those things I wanted to show you earlier. Um, so you can't do this in the Pixel Remaster version, what I just did there, completely skipping that encounter. Oh shoot, I actually just screwed it up. That's actually great. I just, I, I completely screwed it up. I'm so terrible. Um, but yeah, you, you can't do the trick I just used there. And uh, the very way that, the, like the terrain here is completely different. Again, it's the kind of thing you'd only notice if you really, 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 really know this game very well. Like, for example, you know how I'm down there? Like that? That space isn't there for me to do that little trick. It's so great. Anyway, sorry, I just I just wanted to share that. Oh no! I screwed up again! Why am I so terrible? So speaking of structure again, so we just had... I, I didn't even really show it off. We just had, you know, our first dungeon. It doesn't really count, as we already talked about. Then we had our first overworld sec section, where we can only go to two places one of which is here. This is all cutscene. This is our first town section, and arguably our first town section, period. So think about the structure of that for a second. We go from having sand on our boots, excuse me, excuse me. We go from uh, cutscene to taste of power, to first boss, to tutorial dungeon, to cutscene, to the event the sequence we had, which I screwed up several times. So like unique mini game-esque battle, right? Then we have a very brief overworld section, and then town, in that order, which is rather different from how a lot of these games tend to be uh, designed. Whoops. Actually, I'm here. I just screwed up my, my order of events here. Look, it's been too long. I haven't sped around this game in several years. Like, I haven't played this game in several years. Anyways, um, and then after this town sequence, we're going to have what is pretty definitively the first actual dungeon. So of the things that we're counting, the first thing we're going to note down is the first dungeon. Now that does, that tracks a little bit, but that dungeon has no boss. In fact, after that dungeon, we're going to have a second town sequence, and then a second dungeon, and then we'll have what I don't think counts as a first boss. So we were, we, we've all decided that it's the first real boss that counts, right? So I'm not counting Vargas, which is, I'll just say that specific. I'm not counting Welk, he's the tutorial boss. Whoop, 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 wrong way. And uh, I'm not counting Vargas because he's a cutscene boss. So the first actual boss would be Ultros, pretty easy. But then you get to some other games, and I'm sure you in chat can think, uh, in chat, because I'm totally streaming with live, um, in front of a live studio audience, that you can probably think of other games where it's a little bit of a gap in between when you fight your first real boss in a game, whether it's, you know, a platformer or an RPG or a shooter or whatever. Like I was talking about with Mass Effect the other day. It's just a weird stretch. Or like Dragon Age Origins, where the first boss is pretty definitively always going to be that ogre. But then, like, after that, huh? Anyways, more cutscenes. Here's a fun thing. Uh, I'm not going to use magic on Terra in this fight. And if you don't, then the cutscene doesn't happen. But obviously, you're kind of inclined to. Since, you know, this is a... Oh, oh, well, now Terra's dead, so I actually can't... Oh my god, I have just had the weirdest RNG this particular run. Anyways, so uh, you're supposed to you're supposed to use magic and you're supposed to see this cutscene. And it's until if I'm if I'm remembering correctly, please correct me if I'm wrong. It's until you leave South Figaro Cave. So if you are when we get to South Figaro, the first dungeon, that trigger, that that cutscene trigger is still active. So we can still see the magic ma -ma 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 magic cutscene. And what I love about that is for the longest time everyone's assumed there's a line in the SNES version, where someone says, stop swooning, as both Edgar and Locke swoon cartoonishly after Terra gives them a wink, right? Well, you know, because for those of you not aware, Final Fantasy is a fairly serious and silly series and always has been. But anyways, so, you know, you could do that, and everyone's assumed that the people who are saying, stop swooning, is the magic armors who are in the middle of fighting them. But if you do it against some, like, trilobites or whatever, or, or, or some random... Uh, like crab creature in the cave. I just love the idea that crab creature's like, hey, stop running, stop it, quit it. And notice the juxtaposition. So this is narrative pace, and God, this game is gonna score so well when we get there. So we just had a comedic scene. It was even like it's like a, it's 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 also arguably one of those pseudo boss fights. Doesn't count, of course. But we just had a comedic scene. Now we immediately follow that, absolutely, with a serious scene. And we even have some serious music playing for it. But then we're going to go ahead and go through our first dungeon and have some things. And we're just going to have like a breather section. But then it's going to reset the board. The tension is, is lowered because we've successfully escaped. We're fine. The Empire isn't following us. Everything's cool. 
Oh yeah, by the way, my hands were off the controller there. You have to interact with that recovery spring. The game mandates it. It's also a good time to level if you're doing this for the first time. Anyways, I'm getting off topic. But back row. Uh, but no, so the Oh shoot, I actually lost my train of thought. I, I was I was looking at I was thinking about crackers. Don't ask me why. And um and it distracted me. Um <laughs> Look, I'm tired. It's like 6 in the morning or something like that. I had to get up very early to have time to actually record this because uh, it's been several days since I recorded that last, but I think I already mentioned that. I have been extremely busy uh, with everything, and so my time has been absolutely dominated lately. Uh, but it's not even a joke. My, my time is super taking... Oh, yeah, you'll notice that I'm not taking any of the chests. By the way, that's very much on purpose because obviously I don't want any... Uh, I don't want any of this loot because it will actually upgrade twice. Once when we come back through here the next time, and once when we go ahead and hit here, here in the world of ruin. I know, this is such this boggles me. There are walkthroughs, there are uh, strategy guides that don't list this information that are that are apparently unaware of the fact that some of the loot upgrades in this game. It's only a few chests, but it's the ones in Narsh and it's the one in the South Figaro Cave. There might be others that I don't know about. Who knows? Anyways, narrative pacing. So, joke, light, tension. That's what I was talking about. Tension's reset because we've got away. Everything's fine. There's no crackers here. And now we're just doing normal gameplay, right? This is functionally the beginning of the game. We have left tutorial land. We've left cutscene land. And now we're going ahead. We're coming down here. We go to town. We meet Shadow very briefly. You know, nice, peaceful music. We can walk around town and get all kinds of gear and loot and all kinds of fun other stuff. But and we're going to slowly build up to the idea of trying to figure out what's going on with Vargas, as I mentioned earlier, and that will be kind of a tension head. It's a, effectively a side quest or a mini quest because it's fully character focused and has nothing to do with our overall uh, campaign, our MSQ. Yes, yes, I don't. Yes, thank you. I know what relics are. Thank you for explaining what relics are. Thank you. <laughs> I know what relics are. Thank you. I am going to buy sprint shoes because, of course, I am. And we're going to put those on. But it's fascinating the way they structure this. I am stupid. I meant to buy a second spread shoes. Actually, I should probably buy a third. Uh, it's most of our gold, but don't worry. Three sprint shoes is all we'll ever need the entire game. So we are sprint shoes out. There's a lot of loot you can get here, like that one. But there's actually a specific piece of loot we want to get over here. Anyways, so reset, tension. We start building again towards the thing. We culminate. Savin's quest kind of like ends. As we're. Oh, 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 pay attention more. So the tension builds and builds and builds and builds and builds, and then it, it releases. I am just losing my train of thought here because I'm just so stupid. Sorry, I'm actually juggling like four things at once right now. I do apologize for that. Uh, no. Where is it? Where is it? There it is. What the hell? Running shoes, very important. Hermes sandals, if you're using one of the more recent versions. And yeah, we're gonna immediately put uh, Hyper Wrist on him and the running shoes on him. Actually, while we're here, we're also gonna put uh, one of the shoes on Terra just to get that over with. Could have done that in the previous menu, didn't. I'm terrible. I apologize. Once the tension is reset, we have like a pseudo serious, you know, oh, very, very. Typical kung fu drama kind of a thing going on. We'll see when we get there. And then we move on to the next section, which is a bit of a tension reset again. And there's a lot of cresting and waving when it comes to how this particular structure is designed. It's fascinating uh, the way they design it, because it does this a lot for much of the world of balance until it hits the uh, the ultimate tension builder, you know, at the end of the world of balance, which makes sense since that was originally, by all accounts, supposed to be the end of the game. So, what should we name Shadow here? I was thinking we could name him Bob. Um, maybe Shoulders. I like Shoulders. That, that's a good name. Uh, but no, we're just, we're just gonna name. Him. Why is it Caps? Why is that the default? Someone explain this to me. Don't actually explain this to me, unless you do know the answer, in which case let's go for it. I was. I'm gonna go back to muting myself for a minute. See you after the edit. Right. I actually uh, I wanted to show something off, so we're gonna we're gonna steal from this guy, which I know is a strange choice, but just bear with me. Because what I want to do is I want to show something off. So now we're going to cast fire. So Terra's going to use magic right in front of Edgar for the first time. 
no reaction. I know, it killed the thing, but trust me when I say the scripted trigger would happen regardless of killing. Like, I'm sure some of you have seen a thing where she, where it is exactly like that. It's like, ah, oh, magic, oh no. Ugh. And then death, right? But just in case you don't believe me, I will 100% prove this here. See? Nothing. So it is leaving the South Figaro Cave that triggers that. For more completely useless anecdotes. So, second dungeon now. Definitively. Like, there's no arguing this at this point. South Figaro Cave is certainly short, but it still has all the hallmarks of the dungeon. We have a bunch of side paths, a bunch of treasure, a bunch of loot, a bunch of all kinds of fun stuff. So, we'll do that. Um, the... This one's an interesting one, because there's a lot of ways you can balance this section. It kind of depends on what kind of a run you're doing here, though, how you want to do that. So, for example, something I know some players do, well, they will deliberately kill Locke so that all the experience gets dumped into Edgar and Terra so that they level faster. Which certainly makes sense, except for the fact that of the upcoming sequences, the one who's going to have the hardest time by themselves is Locke. Sabin will be fine once we get there. He's, he's got all kinds of things going for him. And Edgar, well, he's got auto crossbow. And Terra's got magic, so they don't really need the levels. What we should do is clearly we should kill Terra. I've been debating doing that, but I think I think we'll just be boring. We'll just go ahead and have her, you know, do her own thing here. We should go ahead and start picking up loot, right? Eh, who needs loot, though? Although there is one piece of loot that's very worth picking up. It's right over here. So for those of you who didn't know, this is here. Atlas Armlet, which is a very, very useful piece of equipment. We're going to immediately put on him. Hyper Wrist, uh, I'm trying to remember, because Atlas Armlet, uh, so Hyper Wrist increases fight damage, whereas Atlas Armlet increases physical damage, or vice versa. I actually don't remember which it is off the top of my head, because I'm a little bit too used to the modern names. Uh, one of them does that. It's, it's like the Earring. The Earring increases all magic damage, right? So the Atlas Armlet, I'm pretty sure, is the physical equivalent of that. So putting that on Edgar means Auto Crossbow now does more damage. Whereas Locke has the other one because he's just going to be actually straight fighting. I love the relic system, by the way. I mean, they obviously Square does too. Uh, for how much Square likes to constantly reinvent the wheel, they have kept the relic system around for quite a while. Uh, we saw it in FF7. Um, we don't really see it in 8. But we do see a system kind of like that in 9. We absolutely see something like that in 10. And it's uh, the only equipment you even have in 10 too. So obviously, like I said, they, they like the system just as much as I do. So can I can I poke fun at a friend here really quick who won't be even watching this video, so that, that's fine. So I have a friend of mine uh, who is, of course, well aware of my love of this game and who is well aware of how good the game is generally considered to be by several people. And that friend put the game down very early. Uh, in fact, I believe it was either this dungeon or right after this, one of the two. Because they hated the encounter rate. Now, no judgment. Li literally, no judgment. Whoops. No judgment at all. I do absolutely think the encounter rate's too high and I always have. But I just, I find that extremely amusing that of all the possible reasons that you could go ahead and just put FF6 down, it's because the encounter rate is too high. Not, no judgment, like I said, no argument. I'm curious what you would in chat think, though. As we've been talking here, uh, there's always been several encounters to kind of get across the idea of just what kind of encounter rate we're dealing with. Thoughts, comments, questions, hatreds? So here we are at the second or third boss, depending on exactly how you define that, because some things define the Magitek armors as a boss, which I obviously absolutely do not. So, uh, you notice, by the way, this is actually a fun one. We actually cannot attack Vargas back there at all. He's non-targetable. He's, he's just decor at the moment, which is an interesting way to do this. So, typical fight here. Um, I, I'm reminded of a quote I, uh, I shared with a friend of mine, Vincent, way, way, way back in the day. Um, I was talking my strategy out loud to him, and I said how important it was to me to make sure to keep Edgar alive, because he's my best damage dealer. And he was like, what? I would figure it'd be Terra, because she has magic, and... Like, at the time, I was like, oh, well, clearly I must be wrong because my default ever since I was a child has been to assume that I'm wrong anytime there's a conflict. I'm sure some of you can uh, understand or sympathize with that. But, um, 
But no, I was not wrong. Auto crossbow is just insanely more useful than her magic at this level. Eventually, magic outpaces it because, you know, magicide and World Ruin, all that fun stuff. But here? No, I was right. And I just find that amusing. Oh, here we go. So, that's the boss fight, doesn't count. Because then Sabin joins, and we have to hold down A. This is very important. We have to have the typical kung fu. I, I, I make fun of this. I'm allowed to, because I don't actually have anything wrong with this. Like, some people will do this thing. You notice I kind of did it on purpose earlier. They'll be like, uh, well, that's just a typical sci-fi thing. Or that's just your, ba your bog-standard romance plot. Or this is just a dumb kung fu story. And they say that as an insult. As if doing a typical story is a negative thing. Which is one of the dumbest things in the world. Whoops. Like the very idea... Uh, by the way, they'll actually tell you how to do pummel if you don't know. Uh, the very idea that something being a typical story is a bad thing is uh, ludicrous, I think is the way I want to phrase that. It's, it's a really, really dumb take. So, the fact that this is a typical kung fu drama doesn't bother me at all. I was just poking fun. It's, a, it's played straight, and it, it is part of Sabin's initial character arc. We also get a bit of an implication of the kind of person he is, that he is the one who, despite being the better trainer, didn't actually want power for its own sake, and that kind of helps give us an indication of his character. It's a smart move. The fact that it's a typical move or a trope doesn't change the fact that it's a smart move, plus the story. Now, uh, funnily enough, Sabin and Edgar here, I don't think the developers did this on purpose, but these are the powerhouses of the party for the entire game. And I know what you're saying, Lord, you just said that magic outpaces it. Yes, it can. But the default thing, if you don't use Magicite, if you don't bother to hyper-level, if you don't get all the extra gear, the thing that will carry you through low-level runs or speed runs or any kind of things like that is Edgar and Sabin. The two of them's uh, special abilities, which is Blitz and Tools, are just universally useful and never stop being useful. And this ties into something, I was talking about this very recently with a really good friend of mine, about the idea of uh, why some people tend to have umbrage at these types of things. Because they look at this and they say, ah, oh, they're just hyper-competent. No, they are competent. They are not actually hyper-competent, they are at the level that a party member should be at. So, there's no actual hyper part of it, you know what I mean? In other words, they are good, I don't think they're too good. It's the Metal Blades thing from Mega Man 2 all over again. And I know people are going to be like, ah, you're dumb. And that is your right to think that, of course. No, excuse me. I'm going to go beat up a squirrel. So, real quick, this is one of the reasons I just went ahead and put a sprint shoes on Terra. Just super quick. The other reason is for the upcoming scene where it's Terra and Edgar, so they will just have one there. But, yeah, I, I just wanted to comment on that, because one of the things I love most about doing speedruns of these kind of games whoop, 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 is, obviously, there's a lot of planning, there's a lot of routing. Uh, or, sorry, wrong word. There's a lot of planning, there's a lot of knowledge. You have to know what is where and how, like all those little tips I was showing you earlier. But, of course... A lot of it's routing, which is what I was trying to lead up to. I love the routing. It's one of my favorite things about speedrunning, is deciding what to do in what order, where, and how, and what. And that's especially true in RPGs, because a lot of people I, I know, they look at RPGs and they think, well, what's, how is it even possible to speedrun an RPG? Because so much of it isn't execution, unlike, say, like a Devil May Cry or a Mega Man. And that's not 100% true. But I can see where they're coming from on that, especially considering the fact that we're not going to get the Genji gloves here. I guess it's actually faster, so no, I will not become your hope. Um, we will not be your hope. Uh, <laughs> but the... It, you could say that it doesn't really come down to execution, and that's certainly a debatable thing. There is definitely some execution on hand, but there's a lot of thought. A lot of thought, a lot of routing, a lot of decision making, because... In generally speaking, if you pick up a specific power up in level one three in a Mario game, it doesn't really change how you're going through level seven six. But in an RPG, you picking up that one sprint shoes in South Figaro, which I did, completely changes the next several hours of gameplay. To use a random example, or to use my personal favorite example from FF6, uh, when I actually used to do a full route of this game uh, rather than the Kafka race, I would pick up several specific rods. I don't remember the number. But it was like several, I had enough gold when I hit Thamasa to buy like this number of these specific rods. And then I would use them strategically on several boss fights after that point. So planning, right? That kind of routing, because that's when you have access to them and that's when you can use them. You get it, you get it. And I was going through another cutscene-y kind of a section, which is going to lead to another mini game -y kind of a section. You'll notice once again that FF6 is trying to break the boundaries a little bit of typical structure. We haven't even, we, we had two dungeons, fairly typical dungeons, 
But now we have something that could be argued to fill the same slot as a dungeon, which is the Leet River, but at the same time doesn't really follow the structure of a typical dungeon, and in fact is just kind of doing its own thing. We also have an escort quest, which, uh, it, that's its own thing. If Bannon's put out a commission, your journey is over. It does tell you it's an escort quest. And I don't think I'm going to give this a negative, to be completely honest with you, because this is more like an absence of a positive situation, the fact that, you know, you don't want him to die. And that's pretty easy to accomplish, because A, you have the brothers' twins, B, you have Sentara, and most importantly of all, Bannon has a free party heal he can use every single round. Now, the catch there, because nothing is simple, is that Bannon's speed is in the gutter. Uh, I've actually looked up, obviously, of course I know this, uh, what everyone's innate speed is in this game. Bannon is the slowest character in the entire game. And if you don't understand how significant that is, he's even slower than Cyan, who is absolutely ludicrously slow. And I just, I find that amusing that they nerfed him that hard. But there's ways around that, too. And, of course, everyone knows about the infinite, you know, level to 99 trick, which I did do back in the day. Of course I did, because you can auto-A in this game. Which I suppose I should explain. Auto-A means... Here, I'll demonstrate right now. I'm just gonna hold down A. That's auto-A right there. I didn't want to keep doing it because I was about to do a blitz. But, uh, auto-A means you don't have to mash the button, you can just hold down the button. It's a very, very minor, but nevertheless extant quality of life feature. It's a... Accessibility features, what we call this nowadays. I don't remember exactly when that entered the FF series, but I know FF6 has it, and I know FF7 has it. And I don't remember any others. I want to say FF8 has it? I don't remember. I don't remember. Is it the kind of thing I'll be paying attention for when we get to the review series? Is how many of these dinky little quality of life features exist within a given game? Oh, and by the way, this is absolutely too high of an encounter rate. I agree with my friend. That, that is something that I concur with. It's just... Anyways, we're almost to the first boss. The first real boss. Okay, so this is it. It's... Oh, God damn it! Of course there's an encounter! Right as soon as I open my fat gob, there's a freaking encounter. <sighs> By the way, another little pro tip. If you're having issues doing, like, say, Aura Bolt, and you're, you're trying to do the down, rotate, forward thing, um... The way it takes input is actually binary, not analog. So just do down, down, forward, or down, forward, forward, and that will be counted as a thing. Anyways, first boss! Here we go. This is it. 54 minutes. Good lord! Yeah, no, that, that, that makes sense. As I pointed out earlier, the SNES games just push everything much, 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 much further out than the NES games, which makes sense. They're SNES games. Now, uh, there's some RNG with this fight. And this can go very badly. I've actually lost to this fight uh, several times. I've actually lost entire speedruns to this particular fight. Because as much as it's like, oh, he's a joke, uh, this first encounter with him is not super fun. And he has several scripted attacks he'll do. And one of them he'll do, he'll be like, ah, oh, you frightened me. And he will specifically target Bannon. And as you remember, if, uh, whoops, 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 if Bannon dies, that's game. This might qualify as a negative, because as you see, yeah, he just killed Terra in one hit. Uh, so that that sucks. Um, I do have a Phoenix down specifically for this fight. This is the barrier right here. Once I get past this in the, in the speedrun, the rest of it's just execution. But if I'm going to lose a run, it's going to happen right here. Thankfully, those the Hermes shoes... Hey, there's that routing thing again. Uh, tends to help with this sort of thing. At least let me get one more fire spell off. Okay, so now he's going to attack Seven. And Seven lived! Whoa, ho, 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 ho. With 18 health. And then he's going to... He should counterattack with Ink, which shouldn't kill her. Nope, I'm wrong. Yeah! Okay, well, she got one last attack in. That was probably worth it. So now I really need to kill him quickly because he's going to attack Bannon, I believe, next does, well then, this is going to be very funny. Uh, okay, that's that's okay. Oh, yeah, that attack right there could have killed him. So, I, we got lucky. Okay, we're good. We're done. Oh, Jesus. Okay, so that's the hard part of the game over. Now we're gonna have a, a humorous cutscene after the, the first real boss in the game. But you're probably thinking, well, hang on, Lore. We've left the intro. We've, we, or actually, we're about to leave the intro more accurately. 
because uh, the intro ends as soon as we get to Mog in a second here. So we're about to leave the intro. We've had the first dungeon. We have the first boss. What's left? We haven't hit the core gameplay yet. So, 2 hours, 37 minutes, 18 seconds. Finally have access to this. Um, this is, again, I know some of you disagree on this, and I know a lot of people disagree with me on this, and I know that I'm the worst person in the entire universe, but um, if we're using the standardized idea of alternate leveling being one of the major gameplay core, core gameplay loops of a game, which we are, not all the gameplay loops have to be, uh, not all the gameplay mechanics have to be unlocked for us to get this. For example, in FF10, you don't gain access to customizing your gear until way into the game. But you do gain access to the Sphere Grid early on, and that's your core gameplay, right? So, similar concept. But Magicite and, uh, you know, this whole thing with, uh, with, with, with Espers is just such a functional core element of Final Fantasy VI that this feels like the moment. So... This is way, 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 way into FF6. And again, as, as I said earlier, it's a kind of a brave choice, a brave decision on their part to decide to go ahead and put this this far into the game. Uh, for reasons I'll talk about when I actually review this game. But either way, that's Scott. So let's let's look at a very, very brief look at structure here, especially compared to the other one. So FF4, you know, fairly typical structure, heavy, heavy leaning on story, not forgetting about the gameplay. FF5, kind of a similar thing, a weird rejiggering of certain elements, and the last thing we unlocked was, of course, the first dungeon. In FF6, it's like, uh, so we go through, you know, all, all this stuff. We go through uh, a tutorial land, we go through a lot of cutscene areas, we go through our first dungeon, we go through several more, second dungeon, we go to our, then our first actual boss, then we go through the three scenarios, which I didn't even show you. Uh, after the three scenarios, which all have their own completely unique structure, all three of them are functionally very, very different, even in terms of, again, and I hate to keep using this word structure, the way that they are designed structurally is completely different from each other, uh, but all of those eventually come back to the big mini-battle, the big fight at Narsh, which then leads to an overworld section, a town section, and then a really open-worldy kind of a section. There's a lot of optional stuff you can do. Uh, Kohligan and Jidor are both completely optional. You don't have to do either on any level. You can also poke your head up at the Dragon Neck Coliseum if you feel like it to get a couple of extra little tidbits there. So lots and lots of freedom. One of the earliest freedom points in the game. Not a true freedom point yet. One of the early freedom points. And then you go all the way to Zozo. I was going to point over here again. You get all the way to Zozo. Go through another dungeon. Looks like a town is a dungeon, structurally designed. Uh, fight a boss who actually nearly killed me because I'm pretty underleveled because I'm speed I'm, you know, I'm blitzing this. And then finally, big cutscene, big revelation scene. One of the one of the uh, uh, crux, one of the uh, fulcrum fulcrum scenes in the game. And then we gain access to Magicite, and now we've hit our gameplay point way the hell into the game after the intro, after the first boss, after the first dungeon. Whew. Okay. That was fun. Uh, it took a bit of time, actually, to do that in like, sessions. I'd, like, pause the timer, pause the game, walk away, get some stuff done. You know how it is. But So I don't think I'm going to have time to hit FF7 right now, or any other games right now. But if anybody is interested in this series and this concept and this kind of structure, this kind of thing, feel free to let me know in the comments or in Discord. Whatever. Who knows? Maybe by the time this goes live, I'll actually start streaming it. Who knows? I doubt it, but it's possible. Either way, I hope you've enjoyed. See you next time.